If you've got your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, uh, we're going to start off in Numbers 10. Numbers 10, and Doug will be reading for us in just a, just a few minutes. Numbers 10. And uh, we will be letting our fingers walk through the pages this morning, okay? So keep your Bibles handy. So I just wanted to go back, as we start our class here this morning, I wanted to go back and review some things for, there are some people that uh, may not have been able to make the first couple of weeks of classes, and I just want to remind us of some things here this morning before we get started, or as we get started. And uh, I want you to know that we're looking at compelling physical evidence. Uh, in this class, we're taking this biblical archaeology journey, basically, so we can see all of the things that are being found that basically coincide with what the scriptures have to tell us. And it's really interesting to me. I hope it is to you. You're showing up, so it must be kind of interesting to you. Uh, do you remember that the Bible is the most published and documented book in the history of the world? This is in case some of your friends ask you about, you know, you read this Bible and you say that you believe and have faith in what the Bible is saying. And this is one of the things that I think many people in the world do not know, the people that surround us in our culture, that the Bible is very prolific as far as all the books that have ever been published. Uh, it claims for itself, Scripture claims for itself to be divine, to be inspired by God. We know this scripture, probably most of us by heart, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, that all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. Well, we quote that, what does that mean, all scripture is God-breathed? What does that mean? No, serious, I want you to tell me. <laughs> Okay, and well, there's other scriptures that tell us that men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, right? All scripture is God-breathed. It came from God through his agents, through his human beings, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Are you one of those? Are you one of those persons of God? And by the way, you'll see that it says in some of the other versions, it'll either say servant or it'll say man. But the word there is anthropos. And anthropos, as far as that word, means human being. So the human being of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That means, what, what does that say to us? That we're equipped for every good work through the word. What does that mean? We don't need anything else for what, Rex? To instruct us on how we should live. Uh, to instruct us on how we should live. Doesn't leave much margin for error or openness about what is really important as far as the Word of God, right? So we also need to remember that it was written by over 40 inspired prophets, kings, and apostles over a period of a thousand years about the same subject. Do you know any, of any other book that's out there that's been written over a thousand year period by 40 people about the same thing? Are you aware of any other book that is like that? There is not. So people may ask, where did you get this written word? How did it all start? How did it start to get this written word? Well, you might remember that it was mass printed first by Johann Gutenberg in 1455 on the movable type printing press, which I maintain is one of the greatest inventions in the history of the world, to be able to mass produce books. Before that, there were scrolls, there were things that were written on papyrus, or they were written on animal skins, and those were subject to degradation. So the Gutenberg Bible that is, copies of it still exist, 
uh, and it was a copy of the Latin Vulgate translation for a thousand years in Latin. And that you may remember that some services of Christendom are done or were done in Latin. There's an estimated six billion Bibles that have been printed in history. Estimated six billion that have been printed in comparison to 800 million Quran and 120 million Mormon Bibles. So again, just going back, the most published book in the history of the world and how it compares to the other writings of enlightened people, right? It's translated into greater than 500 languages and many more, many more are underway. The Bible is desired by people all over the world. They want copies of the Bible. Do you know why people are wanting copies of the Bible? Let's just talk about that for just a second. Why are people wanting copies of the Bible all over the world in their language so they can understand it? Why do you think? Speculate with me for a second. Why do you think people are looking for, for Bibles? They've heard there's some good news. What else? They think that it could be inspired. It could be the real deal, right? Do you think people out there are wanting some hope? They're wanting some hope. They've run into dead ends in almost everything that they've, that they've encountered in their life, and they're looking for some hope. They're looking for a better way of life. They're looking for some peace in their life. My goodness, if you consider the world right now, is there any need for peace? <laughs> I think so. So it's validity. If you talk about the validity of the Bible, it is supported by over 5,000 Greek manuscripts. And there's newly found manuscripts, and we have that in quotes there because the, the, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1948. In fact, there's been others that have been discovered at Qumran since that time. So there are actual documents that go back, that predate the first century, that basically have copies of what has been written in the Word. That we have, I mean, how many Bibles do you have in your house? Huh? Tons? I don't know how many that is. 2,000? <laughs> how many Bibles do you have in your house? Serious. Huh? Eight or nine copies, and I suspect that's the way it is with most of us. And I mean, if you talk about a blessing, now the only motivation that should be there is that you actually pick it up and, what, Betty? Read it. Read it. Yeah, that's right. It's been intensively, the Bible's been intensively scrutinized and vetted by thousands of scholars down the uh, It stands as what it is. It's the divine and inspired word of Almighty God. You know that, right? Shake your head up and down. Yeah, you know that. So I just wanted to review right quick what some experts have to say about archaeology in the Bible. And we'll go through these rather quickly, but... You should know that the people, the archaeologists that are digging things up, they have some kind of unique things to say about the scriptures. This guy, Frank Gabeline, he's an eminently qualified author and general editor of the original version of the Expositors. Follow along with me here. The Expositors Bible Commentary has remarked that the attitude of suspended judgment toward Bible difficulties is constantly being vindicated as archaeology has solved one biblical problem after another and his painstaking re-examination of discrepancies has finally led to answers. Dr. Stephen Ortiz, co-director of excavations at the site of the biblical Gezer, commented in 2007 in an interview that serious scholars, even if they are not believers, even if they do not think that this, the Bible, is a sacred text, still consider that being the Bible to be history because archaeology and the things that are being found things match up so well with scripture. Another expert, Dr. Aaron Mayer, excavation director at the Philistine city of Gath. There was a really famous Philistine that came from Gath. Do any of you remember who he was? Big guy. Big guy, right? He was the excavation director in Gath. Now that is in what is on the news right now. 
Gaza Strip. He said in an internet interview in 2007, you can't do archaeology in the land of Israel without the Bible. So much is there. So much is being discovered. There's 30 plus digs going on right now, archaeologically. The tools that are available to the archaeologists in this day and time involve LIDAR, it involves magnetometry, it involves a lot of different methods. I mean, they can fly drones over places now and see beneath the ground. So a lot of the archaeological things that if you take a look online and you talk about archaeology in this day and time, a lot of these are being pre-discovered because we have the technology to look under the ground now, to look through and see what's there and they can see the outline of structures. So guess what? They go dig. They go find out what's there if they find something like that. Okay, those are, we're done with the reminders. So today, we're in week eight. We're past the midpoint, and I wanted to just review some of that because we're past the midpoint of the lessons here. We're going to do some triple... <laughs> If I can say it, we're going to do some temple tributes today. So one is named Gabriel, blow that horn, the place of the trumpeter, the red line. What's a red line? Do not cross. Oh, we've, that's been in the news the last number of years. All of our politicians and ever the leaders around the world, they have red lines, right? You can't pass this line or you're going to get whacked. Well, I don't know. But anyway, we're going to see a red line here that has to do with the temple. And then there's another one called Let It Be. Let It Be, subtitled Jingle Bells. Let It Be, of course, was one of the most famous songs and most published songs in all time. Someone sang that. I don't remember exactly who. Yeah, the Beatles. Let It Be. You'll see what that means here when we get to it in a little bit. So let's dig in. We've had this slide before. This is the Temple Mount. Covered about 36 acres uh, on each side of, I'll point out a couple of things because we're going to allude to it here in just a minute. On both sides of where the temple, the actual temple was, there were these two big 13 acre areas on each side of the temple. These were called the court of the Gentiles. So many times we think about the temple that the, you know, the Gentiles didn't come anywhere close to it. No, it was decreed by God that this house was to be a house of prayer. And so the people of the Gentile nations came into this place and there were large areas surrounding the temple where they were allowed to come into. 13 acres on each side. Whoops. 13 acres in this area and in this area right here. So this lot, entire lot that we're on here is 5.2 acres. So if you think about that as to how big that was, it was three times the size of this lot where the Gentiles gathered out there. If you look in the book of Acts, you're going to see a lot of allusions to the area of the Gentiles that surrounded the temple. And we'll be talking about in a little bit as far as who could enter the temple and who could not enter the temple. Gentiles could not come anywhere close to the temple. Do you remember that there was a temple guard that was attached? In fact, the temple guard were the guys that come out and got Jesus. The temple guard basically uh, made certain that no one entered the actual temple area for some reasons that we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. So there are three that we're going to talk about today. If you look on the screen, there's one discovery that took place here on the southwest corner of the temple that was buried and that they didn't find until the last 100 years, and I've got the date in a few minutes that was probably top, taken off the top of the temple and pushed down as the Romans were destroying the temple. That's one we're going to look at. That's called the place of the trumpeter. The second one is right up here by the temple itself. And we're going to look at a barrier that was put around and they've actually found the barrier stones, the warning signs that were put there to keep intruders or foreigners or aliens from going into the temple. And the third that we're going to look at was found in this area right here. You can see that's the Star of David, right? Another one was found there, and they actually found what they believe is a part of the high priest's garment. Let it be, jingle bells. So the place of the trumpeter, number one. Uh, 
if you already are there in Numbers 10, verses 1 through 10, Doug's going to read for us. And uh, if not, just listen intently to the great voice that's coming out here. The Lord said to Moses, Make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for calling the community together and for having the camps set out. When both are sounded, the whole community is to assemble before you at the entrance to the tent of meeting. If only one is sounded, the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel, are to assemble before you. When a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. At the sounding of a second blast, the camps on the south are to set out. The blast will be the signal for setting out. To gather the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the signal for setting out. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to blow the trumpets. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you and the generations to come. When you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpets. Then you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. Also, at your times of rejoicing, your appointed festivals and new moon feast, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. So trumpets were used for what? What you just read there, what were trumpets sounded for as far as the, the people of Israel? Pardon me? Okay. Okay. It's alerting someone that something is about to happen, right? Yeah. Trumpets are still used today, are they not? I mean, there is, there is a battle call that comes out of trumpets. There are also trumpets that are used to play taps, right? When someone has passed, a military person has passed. So trumpets alert things. They alert the people, and they alerted the people of God. And, you know, the Israelites were fairly good at keeping things as far as when God told them it was everlasting, that it's going to be an ordinance for you, an everlasting ordinance. Okay, so there's one other one, and Doug's going to read this for us, but this is a reading from the Jewish Mishnah. And the Mishnah was the first copy of the oral traditions of the law. Shabbat Eve. Hold on, Doug. Hold on. I, I'm sorry. You, you know I do this to you, right? Shabbat is what? In Hebrew, that means what? It's the Sabbath. Ooh, y'all are sharp. Shabbat is Sabbath. Go ahead, Doug. And on Shabbat Eve, they would add six blasts sounded adjacent to the onset of Shabbat, three to stop the people from their labor. As the blast informed the people that Shabbat is approaching and they stop working. And three at the onset of Shabbat to separate between sacred and profane. Interesting. So they would blow the trumpets to basically indicate it, that the Sabbath was going to happen. And of course everyone in here knows what was going to happen on the Sabbath. Everything was going to stop, right? There were all kinds of regulations regarding things you could, could do and mostly what you could not do on the Sabbath. How far you could walk, how much, you know, things could, that could be done in the household, many other things like that. But interesting that it says the, the blowing of the trumpets, and we'll get back to this in just a minute in relation to us. All of us. The blowing of the trumpets was to separate between the sacred and profane. What does that mean? My goodness, what does that mean? Between the sacred and the profane. Pardon me? Good and bad? What's godly and what's not? Pardon me? Holy, what's holy and what's not? So the sacred, set apart, right? Holy. It's going to separate between the holy and those that are profane. Interesting. We'll get back to it in just a minute. So, the place of the trumpeter. 
So we know that these trumpet blasts went out. This stone was found at the southwest corner of the temple where I showed you earlier. It was discovered in 1968 by this Mazar guy during early excavations around the Temple Mount. The stone is basalt material, which is an igneous rock, very hard, much akin to granite. It's three foot by one foot by ten inches. It's at the Israel Museum. If you ever have the opportunity and it's not blown up, you can go to the Israel Museum and you can see this stone sitting there. Stone is inscribed in Hebrew with a translation of to the trumpeting place. In other words, it was a Go that way. Yeah, it's over there. Third word is cut off, but the archaeologists have construed the entire inscription to say, to declare the Sabbath, or to distinguish between the sacred and the profane. In other words, it was an announcement. If you were, if you were a believer and a Jew, and you heard the trumpets, things started shutting down, right? Getting ready for the Sabbath. The inscription is believed to be a directional sign, you know, for the priests who blew a trumpet announcing the beginning and end of the Shabbat in the second temple period. Scribe stone was probably thrown over after the destruction of the temple in the city in 70 CE. That's 70 years after Christ, where it remained for almost 1,900 years until Mazar found it in all of the rubble. Now, how about us? Trumpets. For us? Matthew 24. Give them just a second, Doug. Let them get there. I hear pages whirring. Back to the New Testament. Matthew 24. Let's see if it has anything to do with us. Go ahead, Doug. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. So we're not done with trumpets yet, brothers and sisters, right? There will be another one. And if you read in the book of Revelation, it's also talked about in there. You know, we sing about it. We sing about this, right? When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright, and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. We sing about it all the time. Do we stop and think about it? There's going to be a trumpet one of these days, and we need to be ready for when that happens. Any amen? <laughs> okay. So our next one has to do with this area of the temple right here. I mentioned that there was a barricade, and this has some implications for us as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't put it in here, but it has some implications for us as well. This is called a balustrade. Balustrade was around the entirety of the temple, and it's kind of interesting why this was put there. The background on it is in these, so you can go ahead and turn, and I'll interpret for you, and Doug, if you'll, if you'll stop after Leviticus. So this is Leviticus 21, and then we'll go to Acts. So it's Acts 21. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, just put your fingers between those two. 
Leviticus 21, 16 through 24. Everybody make the trip. Go ahead, Doug. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, For the generations to come, none of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God. No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled foot or hand or who is a hunchback, or a dwarf, or who has any eye defect, or who has festering, or running sores, or damaged testicles. No descendant of Aaron the priest who has any defect is to come near to present the food offerings to the Lord. He has a defect. He must not come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat the most holy food of his God, as well as the holy food, yet because of his defect, he must not go near the curtain or approach the altar, and so desecrate my sanctuary. I am the Lord who makes them holy. So Moses told this to Aaron and his sons and to all the Israelites. So we know, as I mentioned earlier, that there was a court of the Gentiles, and the Gentiles could not approach the temple. But as far as service in the temple itself, God was very specific about the types of priests that could come in. And if they had any defects, they were unable to serve. They were unable to serve in the temple. Kind of prejudicial, wouldn't you say? Acts 21. Let's get, let's get the connection here. Let's go ahead and read Acts 21. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Okay, so the connection here is that from the court of the Gentiles and as you went into the temple, there was an area, there was actually a court of the women, that, but, it, but anyway, where the Israelites could enter as far as the temple was concerned was a holy place. Do you remember this, the holy place? And then you had the most holy place that was behind the curtain, Right? where only the high priest could enter and one time a year on the Day of Atonement. So this, this holy place, no Gentiles, no one that had defects or those types of things, particularly the priest could not go serve in the holy place. But at one time there were people that were kept from going to the place that held God's name, the holy place in the temple. There was a separation that was there. There were those who could not enter that particular area. So, they didn't really have access to the Holy of Holies or to that holy place. Do we have any type of uh, restrictions regarding that in our day and time? Are there any restrictions for those of us who are Christians to go to the holy place? Can we enter the holy place through our prayers? And do we not have a high priest that basically intercedes for us? We do, right? So let's read a little bit about that. We're different from, from there. Uh, and I'll show you, we'll get to the actual artifact here in just a minute. Oh, wait a minute, I think I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I am skipping ahead a little bit. So this is the Temple Balustrade Warning Stone. This is basically a stop sign or you will die. As some of you know, I've traveled a lot around the world, and I'm just going to tell you this is kind of an exemplary thing here with respect to this. It was interesting to be in Singapore, and I don't know how many of you have ever been to Singapore before that are in here. In Singapore, they're rather strict. You know, where we have signs around protected areas that says, please do not enter. In Singapore, they have signs around their protected areas 
that have a person standing there with a rifle and it says, if you enter this area, you will be shot. So this was a warning stone. I just say that to say that this was a warning stone that says, if you enter this area and you're not qualified to enter this area, you will be killed. Two of these limestone blocks have survived. One is pictured, which is at the Israel Museum, and a second at the Istanbul Archaeology Museum. Of course, we know Istanbul is in Turkey, and that museum in particular, that was when the Ottoman Empire ruled the particular area, including Jerusalem, and they took a stone and took it back to Istanbul. The stones were embedded in the balustrade, the barrier surrounding the temple. Multiple stones were inscribed in Greek and Latin, but only the ones in Greek have been found. Stone found 75 yards from the site of the original temple was excavated by Clermont Ganot in 1871. Stones were do not enter warning signs and were painted in red. What do we have that's painted in red that's out here? <laughs> Stop signs, right? Translation of the inscription says, No foreigner may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught, whoever is caught on himself shall he put blame for what? The death that will ensue. So they were serious about this, about people who were restricted from entering the temple. Numbers 18.7 says, But only you and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I am giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary is to be put to death. So the temple guard was serious about that. And the thing about Paul with Trophimus, the, they used that as an excuse to go after Paul, but that was an example of how serious they could make things for people who brought foreigners into the area or across the balustrade into the temple. And in Acts 21, that's what they were accusing Paul of. So entering the holy sanctuary for Christians, let's talk about it as far as us. So you can look at these scriptures. Doug's going to read them for us. Ephesians 2.14 is where we're going to start. So let's hear those pages start turning. Ephesians 2.14. Then we're going to look at Galatians 3, 26 through 29, and 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Ephesians 2, 14. Now, what we want to see here is respect how things have changed because of Jesus Christ, our Savior, how things have changed for us. Doug? For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when... In his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Okay, I'm just using now the balustrade as an example from archaeology of this wall of hostility, right? There were people who could get to the holy place and there were people who could not. Go ahead, Doug. Galatians so, 3, 26 through 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do we recognize how awesome that is? In those, in those two scriptures, we are all the same in Christ Jesus. There is no difference. We are no longer aliens and foreigners. We are no longer people that have been separated from God because of our sins. We are now one and the the dividing wall of hostility between God's chosen people, guess what? Read the next one, Doug. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God, 
Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So let me ask the question. Thanks, Doug. Let me ask the question. How chosen do you feel this morning? How royal do you feel this morning? Are, are you a part of the royal priesthood? Are you a holy nation, one that has been set aside for the purposes of God? You know, this has a lot to do with what we're going to experience here in a little bit when we go into worship service. So many times we're going through ritualistically, I think, taking of the Lord's Supper. Take a look around this morning. Y'all have heard me before up in the pulpit when I've stopped the Lord's Supper or before the Lord's Supper and have said, hey, take a look at who's here with you. Get used to them because you may be spending a lot of time with them one of these days. And enjoy the fellowship that you have with these people during the Lord's Supper. It is a time of remembrance and it is a time of being holy. It is one of those things that we should stop and really think about what's been done for us and how we are his holy people. Serious matter when we partake of the Lord's Supper in a little bit. Okay, number three. The golden bell. Let it be. Jingle bells here. Scripture background is Exodus 28, 31 through 35. Now, what you're going to have described for you, let's see, that's left on the screen up there. On the left side of the screen, you see that person standing up there. Do you know what that is a depiction of? The high priest, right? So I find this amazing and pretty neat, really. Then on the bottom of the garment, and what Doug is going to read for us, that there were bells, pomegranates, and there were other things that were attached to the bottom of the high priest's robe. And the only description that we have of this in Scripture, one of the only descriptions we have is what Doug's going to read for us in just a minute. They actually found one of these pomegranate bells. And I had a really neat video that I was going to play because I got a Creative Commons license to play these videos. But it, the thing of it is, over the internet now, these are feeds from Israel. So as you might kind of understand right now, the feeds from Israel are not too good. They've shut down most external getting into the system over there for the Israeli Antiquities Authority and those types of things. If you don't believe me, go try it. Doug? Whoops. Boy, I'm letting the cat out of the bag here. Exodus 28, 31 through 35. Make the robe of the ephod entirely of blue cloth, with an opening for the head in its center. There shall be a woven edge like a collar around this opening, so that it will not tear. Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe, with gold bells between them. The gold bells and the pomegranates are to alternate around the hem of the robe. Aaron must wear it when he ministers. The sound of the bells will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out, so that he will not die. In July 2011, dig on the south side in the channel that runs into the Tropian Valley, this was found. It was in a main drainage channel. This is where the Star of David was on the temple that we displayed earlier. Uh, it was a, for the rainwater because, you know, up on that temple mount, you had to have some way to get rid of the rain, pretty much like our storm sewers, if we have them here in Texas, uh, to the, close to the western wall. And like I said, it funneled the rainwater down to the Tropian Valley. Channel was completely filled with debris collected over the centuries and was being excavated by a team of overseers by Eli Shukran and Ronnie Reich of Haifa University. Now let me tell you, there's a neat, uh, it's not in here, I couldn't put it in here, but there's a neat video regarding this online. If you just go research the Golden Bell and type in Eli Shukran's name, you can pull up the video and you can watch it. It's a YouTube video, okay? Last time when I had our class over in the other building, the same class, we played the video, and it was, it was pretty cool. So apparently, 
the high official who they think was the high priest was walking on the Jerusalem street. And what we'll show next week, uh, Lord willing, with respect to the Pool of Siloam, there was actually a long walk and a pathway that went up to the temple from the Siloam Pool. And where they would have found this was in a drainage channel b beside that walkway, that path that goes up to the, to the temple. It was in the vicinity of Robinson's Arch, which we'll talk about next week. It's the big stairway that goes up in an arch and goes into the temple. They believe that it lost the gold bill. It fell off the garment into the drainage channel between the road, between the drainage channel and the road. The date of the bell has been determined, radiocarbon dating from the first century AD. Here's something interesting. Now, don't ask me, it seems kind of nutty to me that you do go through all of this analysis, but I guess if you're a really smart archaeologist and scientist, you want to know everything about this. They took this bell to the sound lab. Don't ask me why. And in the sound lab, the inside of that bell is a clang clanger. What do you call that thing? Uh, clapper. There you go, not a clanger. Clanger's what I am. Clapper is inside of there. Clapper inside the bell. And the clapper inside the bell makes this sound. And again, he had a whole bunch of them so the people could hear him walking, especially when he went into the Holy of Holies. The frequency of the bell, come to find out, is 240 hertz which corresponds closely to the musical note B. Remember we said, let it be? But why B? And again, this could be complete conjecture, but I thought it was pretty cool. In the ancient world, the note B represented the planet Saturn or Saturday, which was the seventh day of the week. For the Jews, of course, this was the Sabbath. And of course, known as Shabbat in Hebrew. Is that by chance that it was the Note B? I have no idea, but that's what they found in the sound lab. It's in the video. Go look at the video. So I want to talk as we conclude class here about our high priests. Maybe that is a bell from the high priest's robe, right? We have our own high priest. Thank God. We have our own high priest, right? Turn to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to read a couple of, another uh, verse after the couple verses after this. Hebrews 7, 21 through 28. Go ahead. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Another thing to remember during the Lord's Supper this morning, right? He intercedes for us. He's a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Go ahead, Doug. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. The perfect high priest, not like the first one, right? So Hebrews 10, 11 through 14, we'll finish up with this. And again, a reminder for us that are about to go into worship service and partake of the Lord's Supper. We'll finish up with this, Doug. Day after, I'll read it. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all one time, one sacrifice for sins, 
He sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he is made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. We get to concentrate on that here in just a few minutes. Next week, Lord willing, River of Life, Hezekiah's Tunnel from the Old Testament. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure.